Well, hello, Illinois pork producers, and a big thank you to Jennifer Tyree, Mike Borjik, and all of the Illinois Pork Producers Pork Board in uh, inviting me to uh, visit with you this afternoon about what's going on in the pork industry as I see it. I got to, before we start, I got to start with a disclaimer. Understand that we are a trading firm. Anything that I might say that is construed as a trade and you happen to trade it, you are completely on your own. So for those who don't know, I'm Mike Porth. I've uh, been with Partners for Production Ag since July of 2020, previous to joining Partners for Production Ag. I was with Smithfield Foods and before that Cargill. So look forward to visiting with you this afternoon. Wish we were in person. Look forward to seeing a lot of you uh, during the Illinois Pork Show coming up here in mid-February. Again, I work for Partners for Production Ag, per previously Kearns and Associates, and this is just some of the different areas that our bench is able to offer uh, to our clients and prospective clients. So with that, let's get started. So back in the summer of 2020, might have been late summer, I had the opportunity to do the same thing for Jennifer and Mike and for you, the Illinois pork producers. And when we looked at it back then, we had a lot of moving parts, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility. And we were just in the start of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, plants uh, shutting down, uh, uncertain where we're gonna get rid of all of our pigs. Just, you know, as the sign on the right says, we just didn't know exactly where we were heading to. So what's changed? We still have COVID, we still have different variants. You know, we've gone on to the Delta and now the Omicron, but the picture at least looks a little clearer and I'm, I'm looking forward to visit with you a little bit about that. So as we move forward, today's agenda is going to be about markets. We're going to talk about packer capacity of labor. Uh, we're going to talk about demand and exports, a little bit about some risk tools, and then a few things that Jennifer and Mike and you as pork producers uh, asked of me to talk a little bit about some of the key influencers that could help you and our industry, and then what could deter us. So, And then we'll just kind of summarize it. Here, here on the end. So with that, um, let's get started. So as we discussed, the first thing I want to talk about is markets. And I'm going to take a little different angle besides just show you what some different markets are doing between the cash hogs, the CME, the index, and the cutout. But we're going to dig maybe just a little bit deeper into these markets. So the first thing I want to talk about is We've got four cash markets, but they're four different cash markets. We've got the CME lean hogs that gives you the opportunity through several different risk tools to trade to help you mitigate risk. We've got the CME lean hog index on the top right uh, that is the closest cash market to help you with basis management with your CME futures and or option strategy. And then the bottom two, we've got the National Daily Direct and the Western Corn Belt. The ISM would also go along with that. But let's dig a little deeper into what's happened in these markets, because as you see it, you would say there's been some volatility, some highs and lows, and maybe to the naked eye, you'd say, boy, they all look about the same. So top left again would be your futures. And those futures move on a daily basis, higher and lower in several days, both in the same day and sometimes within the same hour. But as you can see, you see some volatility in those markets. And then to the right, you see the two-day CME index. You maybe look across and say, hey, there's not as much volatility. Why would that? The two-day CME index would be a, a, a market that moves a little so, slower uh, as the market is trending higher, in the same way, as the market is trending lower, it trends a little bit lower, but you just see uh, these trends just be a little bit lighter versus CME. And then when you get to the, the two bottom uh, slides, on the left and the right, again, is what I call the true cash markets. And you've got the National Daily Direct and the Western Corn Belt. And again, 
some volatility in those markets. And as we discussed, when you're talking um, with your packer and building that relationship with that packer, and he says, what's the right market for you? You want, of these four, the best, best would be some kind of CME off the futures with maybe some kind of basis to it. The next best to me would be the two-day CME index um, as your top two priorities. Now let's go into the cutout and, co and the primos. We'll bring those cash markets back into play a little bit later when we do some recapping. So again, top left would be the pork cutout, the carcass market that we see every morning and every afternoon at 11 and 3 o'clock on the close. And then to the top right, we've got the loin primo, bottom left, the ham primo, and bottom right, the belly. The reason why I'm using those are the three <clears throat> main ones that are discussed on a daily basis, weekly basis, and, and talked about key influencers to this pork carcass uh, pricing. So now I've set it up the same way. And now I want to talk about the volatility in the markets and what we've seen in the last two, two and a half, maybe three years. Again, we've got the pork cutout from 2011 up through current. And I've got, when I look at this, I look at the volatility from days that's closed minus five to plus five in this blue box. And on the far right on each of these slides, you'll see we've broken out of that plus five minus five a lot more often and we'll come back and talk about that so now let's go to the loins again you see the volatility for the last 10 plus years you look at this last two and a half to three years we've broken out of that box we've had more volatility in it just as an fyi on the loin market for every dollar move in the loins that affects the cutout by 24 cents. So, and we've seen this, and the hams are the same type of move. Every dollar is 24 cents. But as we've seen, we've seen $10 moves in loins, hams, bellies. So in the loins and hams, if there happened to be a $10 move, that's $2.40 effect back to the pork cutout. And then we've got the bellies down here, and this one's been a wild ride. I don't know if you've checked. It's hard to find bacon in the retail store today for under $7, $8 a pound. Or the new retail package seems like we're seeing more 12-ounce packages than we are one-pound packages. So, uh, um, But we will talk a little bit more, but we're seeing more volatility, whether it's the the CME futures, whether it's the pork cutout, and then what affects those pork cutout primarily would be the loins, bellies, and hams as they have the highest percentage uh, uh, effect back to that cutout. So the reason I want to bring this up and, and I wanted to visit about uh, volatility and looking at the frequency of variance either by a dollar amount or a percentage amount in these markets. And what I've shown down here is on the bottom left, I've got a box, it's got the carcass cut out, and then it goes across and has all your different primals. And I'm looking at for every time the carcass price moved $5, loin, butts, picnics, uh, $10, hams, $10, and then ribs and bellies, $20. And if you look at this from 2014 through 2019 almost, there was very few times we saw those kind of moves. You go into 2020 and 2021, look how that has escalated and the volatility in those markets uh, have happened. Now let's just look at what if you just look at the incidence of a percentage move. And we put in here a 10% move in any one of these markets. And so as you can see, the picnic uh, primo has had some large variances of 10% or more uh, since 2014. But what I want you to really focus is 2020 and 21. Look at from the carcass market uh, pork cutout 
all the way across the different primals. Look at the volatility and the, and the variance we're seeing in markets. And to give you a why, you know, a great example. Look at January 13th of just this year. The morning cutout was up $15. The PM cutout was up 11. And then again, January 19th, the afternoon ham primal was up $30.61. That equated to $7.35 move up in the cutout. All I want to do is bring, bring you up, whether it's the cutout in their primals or whether it's the cash markets, We've got volatility in the markets, and I firmly believe it's here to stay. So, um, another area um, that Jennifer and Mike had asked of me because of questions from from your your group and the Illinois pork producers says, "Hey, you know we've got this new CME pork cutout, and we just uh, we're wondering." You know, how's it going? Has it taken off? And uh, versus the lean hogs. And the goal by us and several was that this would take off and be a truer correlation to what's going on in the market um, and possibly take over from the lean hog CME. But it hasn't. So what I've got here is, as you follow my cursor, I've got this blue line, and that is the pork cutout. And along the left axis, we have number of contracts traded. And it trades from zero up to 3,000. And it peaked out in late first quarter, early second quarter of 2021, but it peaked out around 2,500 contracts. And if you want to say, okay, what's that compared to? The orange or gold line here would be the would be your CME lean hog futures. And we've got from 150,000 up to 350,000 contracts in a day that it's traded. And what this thing does show you is the, the that market will have more activity more interest and is still the gold standard in today's uh, marketplace for you to mitigate risk. What, what happened to the pork out? Number one, you could go back and say, hey, it started the wrong time, November of 2020. Uh, so bad timing. Um, you know, there was huge hopes that food service and others would be able to utilize it. We were hoping the funds would get involved in it. And they have not participated. So when you look at the open interest, and that is number of contracts traded on a per day, it's it's minimal. And and lastly, in my own opinion, I just think we've done disservice and miserably marketed uh, this this opportunity. Where does it go from here? Not sure, but I. I, I would say there's a lot of questions like you're asking of me on why didn't this take off. All right, let's summarize our current price discoveries. And what I want to do is maybe talk more about the concern side of this page versus um, uh, the pros on what's going on. And, you know, the concerns is we still have labor issues. And I know you have them there on the farm. We have them with our truckers and logistics. We have them all the way back in the pork chain, but the packing plants are still fighting labor issues also. So what does that do? That creates that uncertainty. Okay, how many pigs are, am I going to run long term versus what we used to do when we look at historicals? And that has to play into, boy, do we want to take on some new agreements? Do we want to you know, get close to 100% filled on just agreements? And from their shoes, you got to say, hey, you know, we got we got to step back and make sure we feel comfortable with where we're at from labor and, and the whole process. Um, so um, also input corn and soybean meal, you know, um, that's got a lot of you concern. How do we manage that? How long are we going to stay in this 75 to 90 dollar cost of production? We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the force majeure that some of you we had acted on, and um, we can sit here and blame the packer, 
But at the end of the day, you know, uh, their backs were against the wall. Also, they had to utilize it. It was a legal measure for them to be able to say, hey, we're going to honor everything we can, but we got to understand we got to get these plants up and going. So it goes back to my thinking of why it is critical. I've said it for a number of years in the past. I've said it on the last time we talked a year and a half ago. You need at least a minimum of two packer relations. And, um, you know, don't think about if you got to go an extra hour to another packer. That might pay its dividends long term having those two relationships. And then just, you know, concerns the current packer agreements versus where they were pre-2018. They're not where they are. So it's up to you to build that relationship for that packer to feel comfortable that you're in it for the long run and that both parties are doing what they said. So let's talk about pros. Currently, the CME lean hog prices provide some great opportunities. So make sure you're managing risk on that side. Packers want a relationship with you. Whether some days you look in the mirror and say, boy, you know, you don't have a, you know, have a hard time finding a, a choice word for that relationship, but they truly do. They want a relationship with every independent producer out there. It goes along with what I said earlier. We need to have, you need to have two packer relationship. Do business with two. It'll pay long-term dividends to you and your business. When I look at uh, different types of agreements, I still think this anything associated to the lean hog CME is best. Pork cutout's not far behind it. Um, and then the two-day CME index has to be uh, a priority also in your discussion. As you look at the cutout, uh, if you cannot get a whole cutout contract, maybe have it be part or a blended part of a price discovery. But when you're talking to, to the packer about that cutout, you need to be talking in percentage of the cutout and not a dollar amount discounted from the cutout. There's reasoning to it, and we surely could visit with you on what the difference is. But that is a big difference, and work hard on building that relationship and asking for that. Um, so uh, if you ask me, the least volatile would be the two-day CME index. Again, for reasons I said, it's slower trending up, slower trending down. It follows the CME as close from a basis uh, price discovery as anything out there to the lean hogs. And finally, I'll say stay away from the Iowa Southern Minnesota Western Corn Belt or National Daily or any true cash market as your sole provider of a price discovery. Boy. So let's talk a little bit about packer capacity. So what's happened here in the last year or so? When we went in the fall of 2020, our total packer capacity was about 2.77 million on a weekly basis. On Jul in July 1 of 2021, the USDA took all line speeds down to an equal number. So there was about eight plants that had uh, approval to run at faster speeds. We took that away. Um, and in fall 21, our capacity is 2.63. So we've dropped our capacity by about uh, uh, 100,000 pigs. And so we are fortunate going in the last fall, although we were waiting for a supply to come to us, but we really didn't reach that plateau. We were fortunate. And, and so right now, we feel coming out of this December hogs and pigs report, we're probably in pretty good shape in this first half of 2022. Um, and do see we will have some larger numbers coming in the second half of calendar year 2022. And a lot of it is just based off of farrowings and litter size as we saw it on the December hogs and pigs as Dr. Myers has been quoted and as he sees it from a data standpoint. All right, packer capacity. Let, let's summarize. Right now, labor to harvest, further process, do any value adding to capture total carcass value is a concern. 
Now, we're just, as several of you have probably seen, we come out of uh, Christmas and New Year's pretty much clean. Usually when you have those two back-to-back -back holiday seasons, we're usually into mid-January, maybe the end of January, to clean up some supply, have a little backlog to get through. And in all honesty, we came through clean. And in fact, we came through to the point everybody saw the big push in the cash shortly after the holidays and running Saturdays. And, you know, packers were looking for pigs and pushing the cash market higher to do so. Um, you know, the, it, what does this thing look like? I mean, I think we have the labor to get the pigs harvested. But when you start throwing in the further processing, the value added, and all the other areas that the packer needs to add 100% efficiency to their business model, it's still tough out there from a labor standpoint. And I don't see that changing. Uh, big push um, to bring technology, but a lot of that new technology is built across seas and everybody's trying to line up what what's the next one we can get in and how soon. So I think that's gonna be moving forward, uh, but we're still gonna have an awfully big need for labor. But the, you know, the sad thing is everybody's looking for that labor and um, every industry out there. So there's a competition um, for down the road. So USDA, as I said earlier, reduced line speeds July 1. Uh, in Q4 of 2021, uh, announcement by Secretary of Ag Vilsack to review line speed again. And currently we know of three plants that previously had, uh, uh, were part of the line speeds um, before, have applied but we, to the USDA, but we also know OSHA will be involved also with the review. So, but I think this next year, we'll see some of those uh, plants that were doing so before get their, their applications through and will start running plants a little faster from a line speed. Hint, be able to get a few more pigs through. So pork production from Dr. Meyer's view as we look in the next year or this current year, you know, Q3 and Q4, we were down versus uh, year over year. And um, as we look in the calendar year 22, as I said, we're forecasting just short of a 2% uh, increase in total pork production, but we think that will all come in the second half of the year. All right, let's talk about cost of production and revenue. Um, I'll, util I'll reference the Iowa State cost of production model. It's utilized by several economists. Um, and But we would say this, this cost of production model would at least be the top 33% of production as in cost. Uh, some by reference, maybe even the top 25%. But let's take a look at this. So with that, um, the key things of 2021 is you look at 2021 and look into the books of this past year, it was a good year. The profits on a per head basis were only second to 2014. 2022, when you look at the forward curve, look at the futures, look at forecasts, what people are talking about, look at current production, what's coming, you know, it looks pretty respectable. Looks like profits should be decent. Understand we're going to have a couple uh, hurdles, uh, unknowns that we're going to have to play through. Uh, right now, you know, when you look at 2021, again, think of this as, you know, the top third producers, uh, 80 23 cost in 2021 with a 22 and a half average per head profit. 2022, we're, we're forecasting an 80 15 cost of production with a $16.21 profit. You say, well, geez, there's not a lot of difference. What, what is the difference? Well, you've got inputs and in general, everybody's costs have gone up from materials. When you're looking at your maintenance and doing repairs and stuff, I don't have to tell you the bill has gone higher um, from where it was two or three years ago. So let's talk a little bit about exports, code storage. 
quickly. Um, when you look at uh, U.S. pork exports, the trend line is higher. Still, you know, on an average, we're 27, 28 percent, pushing 30 percent. Total product goes out in export on a boat, barge, what have you. Year over year through November, we're minus 8.3 percent. And year to date for the year, we're minus 2.2%. We think the year is probably going to finish when they get the December mo uh, numbers in. We're going to probably get uh, somewhere around minus 2.3. Uh, but when you look at calendar year 2022, we're projecting about a 2 to 3% increase. But we're seeing the bulk of those increases coming in the second half. And we think they'll come from China. Over here on the right, uh, you look at the red, uh, that is China. You saw how well they did through 2020 and actually into the early part of 2021, and then they just fell off. The green over here is Mexico. Look at what Mexico has done. You know, they're fighting the same problems we are. They got labor issues. They got health issues. They're buying a bulk of their inputs from the U.S., have higher costs. And as long as those things are happening, there's going to be a need for them to keep buying pork, and especially hams from the U.S. All right, cold storage. Um, you know, let's go over here to the right. This would be the frozen pork. And for a number of years, number of quarters, we were in this 600 to 650,000 pounds of storage. And the pandemic hit. We moved product. We kept it moving. And we've fallen into this 450,000, you know, really 400 to 450,000. Um, we just don't see that changing. Now, that space has been allocated for other products in cold storage. So you got to buy that back. But for the most part, we don't have the further process. We don't have the added value. Um, we're moving this product uh, really right off the floor, right off the dock and keeping it cleaned up. And so... Dr. Meyer feels we, we're just not going to see a significant change in how uh, this trend is going. And that's, that's good for you, the pork producer, and the industry uh, down the road. So uh, let's look at demand from an export. As we talked about, China um, is good, but it could really be great. And we're hoping this second half comes through. Uh, domestically, Demand, you know, we've got some inflation issues, as Dr. Meyer has talked about. We've got government payments are done. Those subsidies are not going out on a weekly basis to those families. We've, um, you know, COVID, is, you know, we benefit greatly, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, from the COVID and the pandemic. And then just overall taste and preference and habits. Um, and then you got to put cost. Pork was a beneficiary. Will it hold? We think domestic demand is will stay good. Maybe not at the plateau that we've seen in the past. This was interesting. I did a Google search. Um, and so you can get on there and how do I do this? Or how do I, how do I fix this? And so there's one about how do I cook? And it was... You know, chicken, beef, and pork. And what I want you to look at is this is when the pandemic happened, right in through here. And before that, it was decent. Pork would be red. But we saw a great surge in people wanting, as they were staying home, cooking more. You know, how do I cook? Whatever it was. But our preference went pork. Here's the interesting when you break out the truly the pork side. And look at 2017 through 2021. We've got the black was 2020. And look at the surge that we saw all the way into the holidays uh, of people wanting to understand better, how do I cook pork? And it actually stayed, the red line would be 2021, actually stayed decent into mid-year of 2021. And then we've kind of fallen off a little bit as we got to the end of 2021. Why, I don't know. We dug a little bit further and just looked at the overall Google trend of how to. And it was pretty much a flat line up through 
uh, early uh, February of 2020, and the pandemic hit, and we just saw a big push. I think this is families staying home, family trying to figure out, you know, how do I keep the kids active? Active. How do I cook this? What can I do from home from a work? You know, and people were just they were using their smartphone. And it stayed well above that previous three, four year trend line. And it was interesting, the last quarter, maybe five, four or five months of 2021, it's fallen off. Uh, don't know if Google's noticed it. This was a eye opening, but more than anything, because of this, the pork market and the demand picked up and people were wanting to utilize good, efficient um, ways to cook and prepare their meat, and we saw we thought we were the beneficiary from a pork standpoint. Okay, livestock insurance. Uh, this is just another area of how you can mitigate your risk. And Joe Kearns from our office said it best in a meeting, you know, the greatest marketing opportunity in the history of agriculture is at our doorsteps. Why? You know, we number one, we've seen a huge increase in this past year of premiums uh, usage. Sadly, when you break those premiums into how many producers are using it, not as many as you might think. Need to dig into this a little bit further. Ability to mitigate risk uh, is one reason, but also a foreign animal disease and or ASF event. And in livestock insurance, what you have to take home, several of you raise your own crop, it is not crop insurance. It's a standalone it is figured in a different way. And the reason I bring that up, it's critical on who you're working with. Make sure that person knows your pork production system, your cost of production, and what's needed to mitigate your risk at the farm. So the LRP program, it's a subsidized program. It's backed by the USDA. It protects against risk of falling hog prices, protects against a foreign animal disease and or event. It settles not against the disease itself, but the event which would uh, affect the market. Settles to the two-day CME index. You've heard me talk about it. That's the market you want to be on. The coverage is available from 4 p.m. Those reports come out at 4. You have till 9 o'clock the next morning to make a decision. The nice thing is you get to look at the opening of the market before you make that de uh, decision. No upfront cost and ability to track the pricing. And then the LGM, which is, which is a crush, brings in the revenue, your hogs, and then takes in your inputs, as in uh, your corn and soybean, and it builds a crush pricing. And again, backed by the USDA, it protects against falling hog prices, foreign animal disease event, coverage the uh, uh, same way, 4 to 9.30. No limit on number of head, no upfront. So, you know, as you look at them, why now? Again, able to protect more hogs than previously. They've raised the limits. They're going to get raised again after July 2022. Higher subsidy rates, foreign animal disease event, limit, limited packer capacity or labor issues, a force majeure helps against that. Historically significant prices. And, you know, at the end of the day, as I said, does your agent know who, how, all the aspects of your operation and cost of production. That is critical. All right, we're finishing up here. I'm probably running over a little. Jennifer, I've got to say uh, sorry for that, but we're, we're going to be done here in three to five minutes. These are some key areas that uh, Jennifer and Mike and you as a uh, pork producers asked me to cover, some key influencers that could support our business and the industry. Short-term supply seems to be cleaned up coming into the fourth quarter, really cleaned up after the holiday season. This is supportive to what the December hogs and pigs and supportive to um, uh, uh, the current hog market and as we see going into the summer markets. Um, and then, you know, when you look at it, why shouldn't it as we look forward? You know, facility costs. Look at some of the costs. You know, if you were looking at building a brand new turnkey, you know, 5,000 sow unit, you're probably in that 3,200 to $3,700 a sow space to build it. Probably 30, 35% higher than it was uh, pre-pandemic timeline. 
getting, and you're noticing it, just doing your normal maintenance repairs, I'm sure. And then you look at input cost. You know, traditionally, as we go into higher inputs, higher grain prices, you would traditionally start seeing uh, some liquidation uh, in the marketplace, usually those with older facilities. Demand looks good. Possibly losing a little luster versus uh, the pandemic era, but it's still in good shape. Exports will be good, but the second half could be really great if what we think China comes back to the feeder and starts buying. You know, the EU uh, ASF foreign animal disease spread in Italy you know, how does, how, you know, they talked about it was 800 kilometers that came across, you know, uh, how did it get there? It's not a big market, uh, but as that EU gets uh, more and more of this ASF, does that possibly help us fill in some gaps uh, that the EU countries were from an export? Surely could. Solution to pig survivability in, gen in general and PERS in particular um, boy, and I know our veterinarians and uh, diagnostic labs and what have you are all working uh, hard on this. But, you know, as, as you probably heard and hopefully we're not affected, but uh, I'm sure too many of you were, um, this PERS and PDV just keeps uh, lifting its ugly head more often than what we've been accustomed to and traditionally outside of timelines when we used to hear it. Um, China inventory, you got to think with the current markets and what's happened the last eight to 10 months, they're still liquidating more sows. Hence, second half of this year, maybe needing more product from the U.S. You know, use all the risk tools that are to your avail. You've got the futures, you've got options, you've got insurance products, you can mix those up. You can use some of those to help you with others to mitigate your cost. Call, call your, your risk manager and talk about that. But make sure you understand them all. And if you're not using um, these LRP and LGMs, um, we would say they need to be utilized and utilized more. So packer capacity and possible line speeds. You know, if we can get a few of these plants started back up and start uh, uh, uptrend on the the line speeds they had pre-July 1 of 2021. That'll be good. Um, the India agreement, you know, you look at it and says, you know, it's a pretty minuscule. I'd say it's almost a decimal point in uh, what they're utilizing now. But when you got 1.3 billion people, if it's five years, if it's 10 years, if it's 15 years, and it grows, you know, a couple percent every year, that next generation is going to reap the rewards. That hats off to uh, Pork Board and, and those that uh, got that agreement done. And then just the innovation of what's going on, whether it's in the packing plants, whether it's on the farm, whether it's genetics, nutritionally. Uh, make sure uh, we're in that uh, pork show timeline that you're out visiting and talking to uh, uh, people at your pork congress uh, that might have those products to help you bring down costs. Uh, what could deter us? Well, demand. Even though I've been, I've spoke fairly highly, and and yes, um, we might be curtailing a little bit, um, but uh, you know, with the current availability of of pigs that are out there as we see it, in current demand, we should be in good shape. But we always have to keep it on the back of our minds because demand is not just domestic it's also exports and if china doesn't come to the table in the second half we got to be concerned covid 19 current and new variants i don't have to talk to you we've had the delta we've had the omicron and i'd take uh the upper side of a bet that there'll probably be another variant uh asf foreign animal disease it's in the western hemisphere understand that your eyes better be open you better be mitigating risk to uh, mitigate uh, any issues for down the road. And I'm, I'm hoping we never see it, but just the awareness of it uh, is going to be critical. Uh, Prop 12, we haven't talked a lot about Prop 12, but we're in the timeline. So, but we, um, 
we've we've got a bogey that we're okay through about June time period. Um, and then, you know, only thing that's going to go to California is those who meet those regulations. And so right now we would say 10% of all U.S. pork production would be uh, going to California. 14% of the d domestic consumption goes into California. That's a big market. We need the market as producers, uh, but they, they've changed the rules to play by. This will be interesting to see how it uh, moves on. Dr. Meyer's opinion would say roughly there's 150 to 200,000 that are Prop 12 qualified, but feels at their, uh, their needs, we need about 700,000 sows. Um, but I understand those 150 to 200 that are qualified right now, those pigs would, uh, those are probably designated to different areas in California. They've been in the system for different niches. And then exports, we talked about China second half, we're projecting that go. And then productivity, the current health of the industry in sow units, nursery grow finish, wean to finish facility with PERS and PED. Um, those are areas that could deter specifically your farm, certain regions that are where some outbreaks, and we just need to understand and, and follow those uh, biosecurity and people movements and everything else to minimize it. So finishing up, will volatility be the new norm? Yes, I firmly believe. Are we set in the $75 to $85 uh, cost of production may be higher with the current input. Yes, I think we're in it probably for the next couple of years. Foreign animal disease in the Western Hemisphere, be aware of it. Risk mitigation and using all the tools to your avail. And again, I can't emphasize enough. We've had an added opportunity in these insurance tools to your toolbox. Understand them. Learn how to use them. Learn how to use the whole gamut of CME futures, uh, options, the insurance tools, and your bases, you know, with your packer agreement. So, packer agreements need to have a relationship to the CME, as in bases. But more than anything, you need to have a relationship with your packer. He wants the same. Again, I'm I'm emphasizing you need at least two relationships. And then Prop 12, it's a law. It, it's coming. It's here. And we're still learning what the rules to play by yet. And, um, you know, it's going to have some impact domestically. So with that, Jennifer and Mike, I want to thank you again in your consideration and asking myself to be part of this. To the Illinois Pork Board and to you as pork producers, I appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to being at the Illinois uh, Pork Congress here mid-February and seeing several of uh, my old friends and uh, people I used to work with. So till then, everybody have a great calendar year 2022, and we look forward to seeing you in a little bit.